I like to open with a question from my Patreon supporters. You can support the channel on Patreon. Um, thanks to the Vasa Law Firm in Sweden. There's links in the description. Patreon supporters get early access to some videos. They get bonus content. They get to submit questions for the live streams. YouTube channel members also get to submit uh, questions for the live stream. So William asks, why was Giga Nevada never really built out? It looks like about a third of the size of the architectural renderings we saw when it was in the planning stage. And David responded to that question saying he thinks a lot of people don't understand. He thinks it's because the factory is a joint venture with Panasonic. I have a different opinion. I'm not saying I'm right. My opinion is that Giga Nevada has not been built out because Elon figured out that the team wants to be in a place, they, they want to build activities in a place where people want to be. So Berlin is a fun city to live in. Austin, Texas is a fun place to live. They're trying to build their operations out in places that people want to be. Austin is a great town. There's a lot of great stuff going on. Sparks, Nevada is kind of empty and boring, and it's hard to get a lot of labor to come work in Sparks, Nevada. So I think there was a challenge in getting a good labor force for what they were building in Nevada. I think they still are expanding. From what I can see, they may be building semi, Tesla semi in Nevada in that location. I think they're building something out there for that. But overall, I think that's the reason. It's just it's not enough population to support the activities. That's actually one of my criticisms of Lucid Motors is their location is not necessarily a great location for attracting the labor force you need for what they're trying to do. So I think that's a really smart thing that Elon figured out is, hey, let's locate our stuff where people want to be. Actually, people ask me where else I think Tesla might build a factory in the United States. I think the North Carolina area, the Research Triangle near Duke and uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, that seems like a place they would choose if they were to pick another location in the U.S. I think Giga Osaka makes a lot of sense. It's close to Panasonic. It's close to Kyoto. Kyoto is... Probably the best place in Japan. I mean, Tokyo is a good place in Japan as well. But for me, I think Kyoto is a more fun place. Kyoto, Osaka, Kobe, it's all one. It's called the Kansai region of Japan. And, you know, where would you locate in India? A lot of people are saying Chennai. I'm not really sure. Hyderabad's another possibility. And uh, Bangalore, Bengaluru. A lot of possibilities there. But anyway, that's the reason why I think that hasn't been built out. But now let's move on. We're going to hit SNL. So this was big, so I, I clipped some things. I'm actually making history tonight as the first person with Asperger's to host SNL. Or at least the first to admit it. <laughs> so this was a pretty big moment for Elon. Elon admitted that he has Asperger's syndrome. This is a form of autism. I thought that was pretty bold for Elon to do that. Um, not like a lot of us didn't think that might have been true. Because I think a lot of people had some sort of suspicion about that with Elon. But hey. You know, um, very impressive for him to get out there and say it. But all right, I'm pretty good at running human in emulation mode. <laughs> Did you think I was also going to be a chill, normal dude? <laughs> I thought this was great that Elon recognizes that he's odd and people see him as odd and he embraces that. So, you know, there's people who are critical of how he did. Uh, and for people who are critical of the skits, SNL has a lot of bad skits over the years. So... Some of this was really good. Some of it wasn't so special, you know. I came as soon as I could. What's the situation on Mars? Now, this is the SpaceX bit. This was actually at the end of the show or near the end of the show where this problem on the Mars colony. And I thought Elon did a spectacular job. I thought the whole this whole bit was great, but Elon did a spectacular job. So there are still heroes in this world. This is Elon Musk. Who? Elon Musk. I'm in charge of the whole Mars colonization project. Oh, congrats. Well, I did say people were going to die. I was never here. Well, I was never here. So Elon, um, it, it was a, like, like a little bit of a space drama. And I thought, I thought that was really well put together. Very, very well done. Uh, that, that SpaceX bit was just spectacular. I loved it. Now, this is the Gen Z hospital bit, which... I don't think this one is going to be as funny to people who do not live in the United States and Canada. I think the Gen Z phenomenon is very, very focused on U.S. And this wouldn't make sense to people who aren't in English-speaking countries at all. And I don't think the same attitudes fit in even the U.K. and Australia. I think this is something that's unique to the U.S. So 
This is a particular challenge. And frankly, I didn't even I didn't think this was that funny, this skit. But anyway, Elon did okay in this bit. As you may have seen on her live, Yo Bestie took a major L while driving her Hellcat. We tried everything we could in surgery, and it was sus for a while. But we have your Bestie on a machine, and we're doing everything we can. All right, let's get a pick. Come on. Crowd in. <laughs> so that moment there where they're taking a selfie. Let me see if I can get back to that. Machine, and we're doing everything we can. All right, let's get a pic. Come on, crowd in. So they're taking a selfie. This is a scene where somebody just died. And this is a reference to what a lot of us see as the attitude of Gen Z. Gen Z is uh, people who are probably under 25. I'm not sure what the precise age cap is for. Thanks for coming, Jim. Thanks, for uh, Mark, for uh, helping out with the uh, moderation. So... There's this tendency for that generation to do selfies at inappropriate moments. And this is a moment where somebody's mother died at the hospital and they get together to do a selfie at the hospital to commemorate the death or something. It's just really odd, um, awkward. The, the, and Anyway, I, I didn't think this was that funny, but it's, it's definitely uh, an American thing. I don't, I don't know how much this reaches outside the U.S. <laughs> Is this really a conversation? I think this is going pretty well. Let me guess. The second dose knocked her out for 24 hours. The second dose knocked me out for about 24 hours. Well, that sounds like a unique experience you should tell everyone about. Oh, sh I said that out loud. Quick laugh, so she thinks you were kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that bit was people get together the first time uh, after COVID and the conversations are really awkward. Now, personally, I have not had this experience of conversations being awkward. I think that there are a lot of people, I, I did not, I know for Europeans, this is hard to hear. For a lot of people, this is hard to hear. Florida did not really clamp down that much. There were a lot of people who were very, uh, stayed inside a lot, even here in Florida. But I went out and lived a, as much a normal life as I could. I saw a lot of friends, I did a lot of things. So I didn't feel as detached from people a lot of people, I know people who literally stayed in their houses for a year. Um, I've been, I was at a party where two of the people who were at the party had, it was the first time they'd been out of their house in a year. So I think for those people, this really nails it. For me, it was kind of like, okay, well, I haven't had that issue, so it didn't relate to me as much. But a, a lot of people thought that was a really good bit. Now, this part is, Elon had a short cameo or a short bit at the end of this fake murder drama. Uh, set in Pennsylvania. Just kind of cute. Might I be of some help? I'm Father Dover. Your daughter and I were friends. Oh, okay. So he did it. He yeah. is the <laughs> murderer. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. You got me. Uh -huh. For sure. You? Ha 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 ha. Never. This is, I, I actually think this is probably one of Elon's best moments. It's not my favorite bit, but it's one of Elon's best moments. Uh, he, he's playing the producer on this Icelandic TV show. That's just really goofy. And that's something I think SNL has done before where they had this German show that was really goofy. I thought this, uh, I thought this was pretty well done. He's just this uh, producer who's in love with the host. I just can't hold it any longer, Uli. I'm in love with you. Please, will you be my girlfriend? Be my girlfriend. <laughs> I have a little bit of money, but lots of goats and ponies. Uli, I think of all the good times we could have. <laughs> Eating fermented shark in the nude. Oh my gosh, okay, right, look, stop. Cousin Chuck told us we were cousins. Exactly, we have so much in common. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward! Could you explain? So, uh, I just thought that was cute, that was funny. It's, it was a pretty dumb bit overall. But I thought Elon did particularly well in the bit. That's just my take on it. I don't know what other people think. Anyway, let's keep going. This is um, Weekend Update is a regular feature of Saturday Night Live. And uh, Michael Che, this is Michael Che and Colin Jost. And Michael Che is interviewing Elon playing a finance expert about Dogecoin. In cryptocurrency is Weekend Update financial expert Lloyd Ostertag. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Well, now, the Doge father. Oh, okay, Doge father. So he's pumping Doge. It didn't work apparently. Doge fell, but he's pumping Doge. The whole the whole bit is a Doge bit. <laughs> but what is that? That bit was 
uh, particularly good in my opinion that he he really had fun with Dogecoin. I, if you're really into Dogecoin and you're really into cryptocurrency, but not so into it that you actually believe it completely, Doge, cryptocurrency doesn't really make sense to normal people. And I thought he really captured the, the fact that it doesn't make sense. Um, and he had a lot of fun with it. I thought, I thought that was a per particularly well done bit. So anyway, let's go on. This is the Western bit. This is a tribute to Earl, Earl of Frunk Puppy. He hasn't responded on Twitter, but as far as I'm concerned, this was a, a it probably wasn't intentional, but Earl's in it. You tunnel down into the earth and come up underneath them. They're expecting a direct attack, but if we tunnel into the earth, we could come up underneath them and surprise them. Leron, I thought you was the electric horse guy. Yeah, isn't that yours plugged in outside? <laughs> Sure, I do like electric horses and self-driving horses, which are just horses. So you got a, you got the Tesla plug in there, right? Nice. We got a SpaceX plug later. Uh, er, you saw earlier that was really towards the end, but uh, nice little space uh, Tesla plug in there. And Elon, I, I thought Elon did a reasonably good job. He had some uh, weak moments in this bit, but I thought overall he did a pretty good job in this bit. Over uh, overall. <laughs> but I've also built a machine. That can dig a tunnel 10 times faster than a gopher. I would love nothing more than to fornicate with you, Louisa. But the overwhelming odds are that you have syphilis. Excuse me? It's actually a compliment. It means you're successful at your job, which is a prostitute. Oh, well then, thank you, Leron. See, this is a gentleman. There's Earl. History always remembered Earl. The defense. And then uh, there's another bit here. Uh, for those who know the video game, the Mario, Super Mario video games, Elon plays Wario, who's, quote, evil, evil Mario. But, of course, not the question is whether he's really evil, whether he killed Mario. This is dumb, but it's cute. Calls Wario. No, I am not the evil, I just uh, misunderstood. And some of the anti-Italian hatred in this courtroom is uh, disgusting. Oh uh, yes, he started eating uh, mushrooms. At first it was a microdosing, and then it became a macrodosing. <laughs> and then sometimes you see him uh, flashing like he was invincible. That's when he was on cocaine. Uh, yes, I, I hate for it to come out like this, but Luigi was uh, sleeping with Princess Peach, Mario's wife. Ooh. You and I, we never sleep together. I you never touch him under the overalls. So that was Grimes. If you didn't catch it, that was Grimes. I mean, I'm uh... actually. It was what? This... You are... this is Elon's girlfriend and the mother of his youngest child, Grimes, in uh, the Princess Peach or whatever. I don't even know the character's name, but. Uh... Very cute overall. I thought I thought overall Elon did well. For those who don't know, um, SNL is not SNL is a show that's like almost fifty years old now. They they've always had hit or miss skits that you know it's a comedy show where they do different bits, skits, whatever, and some of them are funny and some of them aren't. Overall, I thought it was a pretty good outing for Elon, and I thought the show was pretty fun. Um, Different people are going to have different opinions. So, so for people who hate SNL, they're going to hate SNL. For people who hate Elon, they're going to hate Elon. From everything I can tell from all the Elon fans, they loved it. I personally loved it. My, my, I watched it with my, my older child and uh, with Abigail, who you guys have seen on this live stream. And my wife watched some of it with us. You know, it wasn't spectacular, but it was pretty good. And, you know, considering that he's not an actor, um, I, I thought especially that SpaceX bit, he really nailed it. So, and that wasn't live. I believe that bit wasn't live. But anyway, there's a little bit more here from New York City that I clipped. This is Cybertruck in New York City. I assembled some clips from different uh, Twitter videos of Cyber. This is the Tesla official video of Cybertruck in New York City. This is a line of people waiting to see Cybertruck at the Tesla store. They put the Cybertruck in the store and a huge number of people were waiting just to see it. Then we've got um, just random clips from people on the streets who saw Cybertruck, and I edited a little bit to make this easier to see. 
but the thing looks like it's from outer space from the future it is just a real spectacle and elon was asked on twitter is this the final design and elon said this is what it's going to look like there aren't any significant changes to the design coming so just you know people are excited to see it people there's all these people taking videos of it as it goes by taking pictures uh it is really captivating the public um, Cybertruck really stands out. Elon and Tesla have done a really good job. Franz Holzhausen, they just did a spectacular job of doing this. And this is, uh, this is the la I think this is my last clip in this video. It's just Cybertruck coming out of the dealership, out of the Tesla store. And that white Tesla Model 3 that was behind it there, I think that was following the Cybertruck around New York City and, and most of the other clips. So, yeah. Anyway, so that was cute. And um, there's a point to all this, which the whole Mars catalog, that's Omar Kazi. Omar points out that um, the car companies spend billions. I was actually talking with Omar last night on Clubhouse about this. A group of us were talking that the, the car companies, the traditional car companies spend billions of dollars a year advertising their cars. And Tesla does not spend money on advertising. That's money that goes into building factories. That's money that goes into making FSD work. That's money that goes into making the cars better. And Ford spends $3 billion. You know, imagine if Tesla, what Tesla wouldn't have been able to do if they had been spending $3 billion a year advertising. You know, a, a billion dollars is another factory or $2 billion is another factory. It's, it's really striking how important it is that Tesla makes great products that people really love and that they're, they tell their neighbors, hey, you got to try my Tesla out. Um, you, you know, and Cybertruck is so captivating that that's the kind of thing that just drives marketing that, um, Model S when it hits, which should be in the next few weeks, when Model S uh, Plaid actually hits, not Plaid Plus, but Plaid, when it actually hits and people are taking it out for a drive and they do sub two seconds, zero to 60 times, that's another thing that is just going to capture people's attention like crazy. So, you know, it, it's such a striking difference that Ford can spend $3 billion a year advertising cars and Elon can bring Cybertruck to New York City for SNL and get massive attention, uh, media attention. And, that's another thing on SNL. I don't think I mentioned this. I didn't put any prepare anything for this, but I watched the SNL in Florida and apparently different parts of the country saw different commercials, but Lucid Motors did an early commercial. Um, some people said that they saw a Ford uh, Mach-E commercial, Ford Mustang Mach-E commercial. I saw a Volkswagen ID4 commercial. I saw a Volvo electric vehicle commercial. Other people saw, there was one other one that some other people said they saw. So. I doubt that these electric vehicle ads are appearing on SNL normally. And I think they probably spent a lot of money to get their ads in on SNL. It's really striking that Lucid Motors, which doesn't even have a car to sell yet and has no anticipated target date that we know of for actually selling a car, spent millions of dollars promoting a car that doesn't exist yet um, because they're just so trying so hard to ride on Tesla's coattails. And I didn't, honestly, I didn't even think they're... Their ad was a little too subtle. I'm not sure how much people grabbed it. And I'm not sure the SNL audience is the right audience for Lucid, which is, you know, starts at $80,000 and they're not going to be selling anything below $100,000 until sometime next year if they deliver on what they claim. So overall, that was pretty cool. Um, I don't think I had anything else about SNL. I really enjoyed it. I hope you guys liked it. I think Elon and his crew had a good time. They did a Mother's Day thing. May Musk was on with Elon at one point. I decided not to include that clip because, frankly, I thought it was a little awkward. I, I thought it wasn't something I could clip really short. I thought May was great. I thought Elon was great, but it just somehow didn't. I couldn't find a short clip that worked for that. So overall, I think this was a great outing for Tesla, a great outing for Elon. Really good. Uh, it's probably really good for SNL. It's actually, one of the things there was a, this conversation on Twitter and on Clubhouse about how much Elon's fan count, follower count would go up on, on Twitter. And I actually think this did a lot more for Saturday Night Live than it did for Elon. Elon's, as far as, far as I can tell, Elon's Twitter following did not go up much at all. Maybe it went up 100,000. People were talking about going up 2 million or 5 million. I predicted 500,000. It looks like I was high. I think it only went up a little bit. But I'm sure this gave Saturday Night Live relevance they haven't had in a while. So that Because they, they even promoted like next week's show. And I was like, who? I don't even know who those people are. And I should mention Miley Cyrus was on the show. Miley Cyrus was great. Uh, Miley Cyrus seems to be an Elon Musk and Tesla fan. 
Uh, speaking of which, Elon Fan Club t-shirts, link link in the description below. Please, uh, all kinds of t-shirts. Uh, right below the video description, you should see a bunch of t-shirts that are that, that sort of the hot things that the products are going on, including... Oh, I don't think I put this in the... I don't think I put this in there. The Elon... Water bottle, that's in the merch store. Elonbits.com if you're interested in that. Anyway, I want to move on to SpaceX. I was really excited. I think this was a spectacular week for SpaceX. This was an absolutely spectacular week for SpaceX. You know what the big thing was this week. You ready? This is big. You all know it. So this is Starship SN15. This is the launch. Um, I, this is my short clip of SN15. It takes off. Everything performed well. It uh, goes into the cloud. We lose some video at various points. So I took out... I, I went to sort of the best parts of the launch. I love this particular shot right here where you can see the three engines underneath. But it goes into cloud. You know, we, the signal was not consistent. So this is going to skip around a little bit. But you can see it's doing well. Launch is going great. The water bottle's dope. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin says the water bottle is dope. Um, so the, the signal... So, takes off. Great takeoff. Everything went well. And then... Just passed one just minute in the flight. We're through two kilometers altitude. All three Raptor engines continuing to burn. Next major event, about one minute, is we will turn off the first of the three this, Raptor engines. This is about where we start to lose signal and everything goes kind of crazy. So now it's station. descending. We're in the horizontal defense, descent phase now. We're passing six kilometers. We skipped ahead a couple of minutes. You can see Starship descending. And uh, there, there was not a lot of good video of this. You could see it kept breaking up. But you could just see how it's descending. And then coming up really cool. This is going to be fun. This is the flip. If you look really close, you can see the ground come into view. Watch the ground come into view. Ignition. And then it sticks Starship, to landing. Heading back to the landing zone. I'm sure you've all seen this, but just absolutely love this. So I think, I'm not sure the general public appreciates... Oh, thank you, Vic Shaw, for your support. I'm not sure that the general public appreciates how important this is. Um, this is the step that takes humanity to Mars and beyond. I, I really wonder how many people fully... Before SpaceX, NASA, anybody who was launching payloads into space, it cost about $10,000 a kilogram to get a payload into low Earth orbit. Once now that SpaceX has come along and the Falcon 9 is executing consistently, Falcon 9 has lowered that cost from $10,000 a kilogram down to maybe $2,000 or even $1,000 a kilogram. I'm not sure. I think the internal cost for SpaceX is probably in the ballpark, excuse me, of $1,000 a kilogram for a launch. I think their price to customers may still be around $2,000 a kilogram. Starship is like totally next level where this is heading. Because basically what's happening is it's much larger. And the reason Falcon 9 costs as much as it does, or a big chunk of the cost of Falcon 9, is the second stage is not recovered. So they build this expensive second stage, and they can't reuse it. Starship, the idea is the first stage comes back and lands. The second stage goes up into orbit, comes back and lands, and you're able to reuse both. And so the cost of flying is basically just the cost of fuel and some overhead, but you're not, you don't have to rebuild these big ships anymore. If they're able to deliver that, and Elon has estimated that the cost of launch is going to be around $2 million for a launch, and they're going to be able to launch much larger payloads into orbit. So I believe they're going to get the cost of a, launching a kilogram in orbit down, not from $1,000 to $100 a kilogram, but getting close to $10 a kilogram. This is a radical, radical reduction in the cost of launching payloads into orbit. And it, that's what makes the moon easier to get to, and that's what makes Mars viable for relatively low cost, is you launch payloads in orbit, you bring up uh, fuel tankers to refuel. If you can get that done, then the trip to Mars, you're able to deliver large payloads to Mars. And I think Elon's dream is getting to where crewed missions to Mars cost $200,000 a person. That's return trip. Most people aren't going on the return trip, but... $200,000 for, uh, for a trip to Mars. 
if you want to put a million people on Mars and it costs $200,000 a person, that's 200,000 times a million, that's $200 billion. Well, that's not that bad, right? To get a million people to Mars, $200 billion, it's not that bad. Do I have my numbers right? 200,000 times a million, 200 billion. I think I got my numbers right. So um, this is what makes it possible for humanity to go out and explore space and hopefully not end up like Pete Davidson did in the, <laughs> in the skit. I left that part out. Um, if you haven't seen it, SNL is on YouTube. Check out the SNL YouTube channel. You can see all that. You can watch the, all, the, all the bits. But, um, and I figure, all right, $200 billion to get the people there. And say it's four times as much to get their stuff there. It's a trillion dollars. Well, if Elon's going to be a trillionaire, which a lot of us think he is, if Tesla 50X is from where it is now, if SpaceX achieves Starlink and Starlink, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, if Starlink ends up being a $5 trillion company, Elon owns half of SpaceX, right? If SpaceX becomes a half of a $5 trillion company, then Elon has $2.5 trillion from SpaceX. And then he has trillions from Tesla. He owns a quarter of Tesla. Tesla goes to be a $10 trillion company. He's got $2.5 trillion from that. He's worth $5 trillion. Dropping a trillion dollars on a Mars colony, that's his mission. That's what he's going to be able to do. He doesn't need governments to do it. It would be helpful to get government support. It would be helpful to get other private sector support. But we're getting there. It's, it's really huge progress. Anyway, so really, really important that SN15 is that step towards full reusability of the entire launch platform. They still need to do some, a lot more testing. And then another detail here about SN15 is Elon is talking about reflying. I predicted this actually, that they would refly it. This is sort of essential to the way they do things. You test things until failure. Well, it hasn't failed yet. You got to test it again. And if they, if they can test SN15 once or twice more, that means they don't have to build another rocket. You know, they're, They've got SN16 is about ready. I think they're working on SN17. And then SN20 is going to be a next generation rocket. So if they don't achieve everything they can achieve with SN15, 16, and 17, they might have to build an 18 and 19. By testing SN15 more and then testing SN16 more, they may not have to finish SN17. They may not even have to build SN17. It may save them the cost of building other rockets so they can focus on the next iteration, which is SN20 the next major revision of the platform. Um, and I think one of the, you know, the goals are to, to be more efficient at making them. And another big goal for Elon is to get the weight of Starship down. The less Starship weighs, the more payload it can carry into orbit. The less Starship weighs, the easier it is to do deeper space missions. Um, the, the, there's a tyranny of the rocket equation. If you ever Google it, tyranny of the rocket equation, the more mass you have in the ship, the less mass you can carry, the harder it is to increase your velocity. Velocity is what you need to go places. So if you want to go out to, the, to Mars, you want to carry more to Mars, you want to go beyond Mars, you need more velocity. And these are all things that they can achieve if they can lower the mass of the ship. And one of my shirts, again, check the, check the description below or look below the description. One of my shirts is, is a vari uh, some variability in what kind of starships there might be. Uh, Elon talked about stretching the tank so you could get more fuel in and have a smaller payload. That would allow the ship to achieve more delta V. That's change in speed, increase in velocity so it can get to farther places. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for variation in there. Okay, so then there was this tweet from Elon. This was earlier in the week. There's an article in The Atlantic about going to Mars. And Viv, who is one of the third row podcast people who's interviewed Elon and a, a big player in Tesla Twitter, she said, are we still aiming for the 2026 launch window? And Elon said, 2024 is not out of the question for uncrewed flight. Um, if we can get an uncrewed flight to Mars in 2024 and that delivers some payload, and maybe we do more than one uncrewed flight in 2024, the sooner we get consistent missions of crewed missions going to Mars with Starship, the sooner we can do crewed missions. If we can do 2024 with a crewed mission or a couple crewed missions, then in 2026, we do several uncrewed missions to Mars and we land a lot of material and we make sure that we're doing it right that we can safely deliver astronauts to Mars, that we can deliver multiple crew, multiple uncrewed missions to Mars safely, that gives a lot of hope that we can deliver a crewed mission to Mars safely. So if we can do 2024 and 2026 with uncrewed missions, then 2029, I think it is. I don't think it's 2020. 
I think it's 20, I think it skips because it's 26 months oh, it's separation. I think you end up in a 2029 launch of Humans to Mars. You actually get Humans to Mars before 2030. And, you know, maybe it's 10 people, maybe it's more, and you start the process of building the Mars colony. Absolutely spectacular stuff. So the other piece of SpaceX news was, I gotta put my headphones on again, sorry. Starlink land. There was a Starlink mission this morning, and this is the the booster landing. This is um, the Falcon 9 booster returning. You can see this is a beautiful shot of it returning to the barge, the autonomous drone ship. Sticks the landing. Absolutely spectacular. This particular booster. It is. It is the tenth time. There you have it. You have a confirmation. That is the 10th time that that particular booster has launched a payload into orbit and brought itself, launched a, a second stage up to, to put a payload in orbit, an orbital rocket booster, and then returned and landed safely. So 10 times. People thought this was science fiction. It's not science fiction anymore. This is reality now that you can launch rockets into space and bring them back. Absolutely spectacular. These rockets are going up. They're going to extremely high velocities. They're carrying payloads and they're coming back and they're able to reuse them. Reusability is what gets that cost of launching payloads to orbit down to much lower numbers. It's what get, makes it possible to go to the moon. It's what makes it possible to go to Mars for reasonable cost. Very, very important. And one last thing about Starlink. That was a Starlink launch that launched another 60 satellites into orbit. Um, Michael Sheets reported, and I think maybe SpaceX reported this, that they've received over 500,000 orders for Starlink satellite internet service to date. So if you figure they get a million customers paying $1,000 a year, that's a billion dollars a year in revenue for a startup. It's barely gotten started. And I think ultimately they're going to have millions and millions of customers, maybe more than 100 million customers. It's gonna be $100 billion plus in revenue a year. It's going to be a multi-trillion dollar company. Just Starlink, not even talking about SpaceX. A really, really cool stuff. So that's it for SpaceX. Let it let us move on to. Oh, okay. So this week I interviewed James Dauma. James Dauma, that's him over here. Obviously, this is me, James Dauma. James Dauma, I believe, is an expert. Oh, thank you, Breaknet Trent, for your support. Geometric Energy Corporation announced that the Doge 1 mission to the moon, the first ever commercial lunar payload in history paid entirely with Doge, will launch along a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Very cool. So um, if you check uh, the description to the video, if you, just, if you check the description to this video, I have a link to this other video that I did with James Dalma where I had an extensive conversation with him about a whole bunch of things related to FSD beta and more. We also talked about Dojo and the future of Dojo. We talked about Neuralink and we talked about robots. So I am working on making shortened, if you don't want to watch the whole thing because it's over three hours, I am working on making a short, shortened versions of parts of this video. Right now I'm working on FSD and then I'll probably do one on the robots and I'll probably do one on Dojo. Uh, I'm not certain how I'm going to break it down yet, but and the, the one on FSD is going to be long. It's not like it's going to be a 20 minute video. I'm already over 20 minutes and I just got started. So um, anyway, great interview. And I just want to talk about this interview a bit. We talked about FSD beta. Um, I'm trying to get an, uh, for myself, and I think by my learning this, hopefully other people are learning too, I was trying to get a grip on understanding what's really going on in the car, what's really going on in the chips that helps the car drive itself. And I started off talking about inputs. And I will say that I didn't think, you know, it's funny because people said it went great. I actually felt like the conversation, I mean, I liked talking to him and I'm hoping to interview him again. But I thought we were talking past each other a little bit. I, I felt like maybe he didn't understand my questions or I didn't understand his answers. Maybe it was a little bit of both. A couple of times I asked a question and he came up with an answer that was to the question I probably should have asked. So I think he's better at this than I am. But I was trying to get a grip on the basic question. What are the inputs to FSD and what are the outputs? And, you know, as far as I can tell, the major input is cameras and maybe there's some other inputs like maybe... Well, it was using radar. It appears they're going to stop using radar. There's sonar, but that's not really necessarily an input. Um, can it hear? What came up in, in the course of the conversation was whether there's any microphones that can be used as input. Um, 
anyway, so that that's a big deal. We talked about the perception stack that there's different things that FSD is doing in the car. And I think what we mean by FSD was actually one of the, the battles between myself and James is what, what exactly do we mean by FSD? I'm thinking these two chips on the car that are taking video data in and outputting instructions to the car about where to go. It's apparently not that simple. And actually it was kind of interesting. I was thinking the output of the FSD is go left, go right, go straight, you know, accelerate, brake, whatever. And he described a lot of outputs that there's a lot more going on that we don't see and we would not notice that it's putting out information that the Tesla team can then look at and see, are these outputs what we're expecting? Um, talked about object identification is a big thing that the car does. That's a stop sign. That's a child. That's a, you know, this is the, the curb line. This is the double yellow line. It's, uh, this is a traffic light. Um, and we talked about a vocabulary for objects. One of the big things for me that I, I was trying to get from him was understanding how we measure how well FSD is doing. What is the Tesla team doing to assess how well is this working and how do we compare that to what, what our goals are? So I think that was really, really good. Um, talked about iterating. We talked about interventions. This is another thing that I'm, I think I'm right about. I'm not, I'm not sure he gave me the clear answer that I wanted, but I think we, those of us who pay attention to FSD, we, we overvalue interventions. Interventions are an important signal to Tesla that there may be something wrong with the car here. And there are particularly important moments where interventions are still valuable. But on the whole, on average, a lot of interventions might be wrong, right? Once FSD gets better than human, then human interventions are most likely going to be wrong. So human interventions are not the best way to improve FSD. There have to be other things that they're looking at. So we had a pretty extensive conversation, like what are they looking at? What are they measuring? How are they deciding what, whether FSD is getting better or worse or you know, whether they're achieving the goals? Um, I thought that was great. I had this theory about crash probability. And I think James said, no, they're not doing that. That to me, the car is sort of computing its probability of getting in a crash. And the goal is to minimize the probability of crash. And James does not think it's doing that. So, okay. And we talked about subjective, you know, like if I drive the car and I think it didn't drive well, but you drove the car and you thought it did drive well, humans have subjective opinions about things. That's not necessarily helpful. He mentioned the BEV model and I didn't know what he meant. That's the, the, the bird's eye view model that, you know, not looking at eight individual cameras, but you know, stitching together a whole picture from the cameras and looking at that. There was a question from Halter Ferguson Financial about major rewrites that I thought James had a really good answer to. So again, this is a description of the videos in the description. There's a link to it. It's three hours long. I'm going to do a, a, a shortened version of it coming up. We talked about what an inference chip is. The chip in the car is known as an inference chip. Apparently I was wrong about what the inference chip is. We talked about levels. We, you'll often hear people talking about whether a vehicle is level two, three, four, or five. And I think James and I agreed on this, that the level system is mostly irrelevant. The engineers are not trying to make a level five car. They're kind of trying to make a car that can drive better than human. They're trying to make a car that can drive as safely as possible, as well as possible, as efficiently as possible. They're not trying to achieve some arbitrary level that somebody else created. So, um... We talked about Dojo quite a bit. We talked about Neuralink and whether Dojo could help with Neuralink. We talked about shadow mode. This was something I was particularly interested in. You know, does, how much does the car learn when it's not driving and you're driving? The human is driving the car and the car is watching and the car is making its own predictions and all that. I thought that was really good. We had a really good conversation about robots. That's going to be a video I'm going to make. James has the opinion, which I think he persuaded me of, that the most important robot that Tesla could make, there's a decent chance. I think he thinks this is going to happen. I don't think he said it, but I think he thinks this is going to happen. That Tesla is going to make humanoid robots. That and and I was talking about, let's say, specific task robots like a roofing robot, um, drones to drone delivery robots. And James seems to think that the most important robot is a humanoid robot, and he made a pretty good case for it. That we all have created a space that is designed for humans. So a robot that fits in the spaces that humans fit in and, and is able to do the things that humans are able to do is the most able to help us with the things that we're trying to do. So very, very great conversation about that. I still think that roofing robots are really important for Tesla so they can install solar roof. 
We also talked about drones versus robo taxis or robots for deliveries, because that's a hot topic that uh, ARK Invest has talked about. There's a lot more. If you check the video, there's actually a table of contents um, that's actually longer than what I printed for myself. So I would encourage you to check that out. All right. So gonna have anything i think that's all i had for fsd so we're gonna move on to the patreon the second round of patreon q a again um patreon supporters get to ask questions uh on my patreon that i use that i address first in the live stream we're going to talk about do the chat q a after that i also do this with my youtube channel members who are at the exclusive content level or higher and actually half the questions today are from the the youtube channel members um, but Patreon supporters and YouTube channel exclusive content members get early access to some videos, bonus content. They get to submit questions for live streams and there's more benefits. So please consider joining Patreon. I don't make a lot of money from doing the live streams. I make more money from doing the other videos. Um, getting support on Patreon in particular, getting support as, from YouTube channel members helps make it make more sense for me to put my time into doing this. There's other things I could be doing my time. I probably wouldn't anyway. I'm really enjoying doing this. But um, that's something that I think a lot of YouTube channel creators appreciate is that support on the channel or in particular on Patreon. Um, Patreon is, I think, a better environment for it. Anyway, so let me go through some other questions that we had. Mark asked, how much of the media FUD is orchestrated versus trying to make a story with high profile to get kick clicks to survive? So media FUD has been a hot topic. Uh, FUD is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. There is this tendency for the media to uh, put very, very negative things about Tesla and Elon Musk up and say, just constantly tell bad stories. There was a crash in Texas. I think we talked about this last week. And uh, Mark's question is, is this orchestrated or is this just about getting clicks to survive? I think it's both. I think there are certain media who like Consumer Reports, like Jalopnik, um, I think there are certain media outlets that get funded by other companies that are competing with Tesla. Check out the merch. Links below, elonbits.com. So if you watch the Now You Know channel, they had a video a while ago where they talked about uh, the oil industry in particular, how much money they have to lose with the shift to electric vehicles and the shift to solar and the shift to wind that this is really gonna cut into their revenue and they make trillions of dollars a year. So if they spend billions of dollars over a few years sending negative messages about Tesla and trying to make Tesla look bad, and it slows the electrification by six months, then they make a half a trillion more. So it, their theory is that there is, to some extent, that this media FUD is driven by that. I do think that there is also a incentive to get clicks that generally speaking negative articles get more clicks and generally speaking articles with tesla in the headline get more clicks or elon musk in the headline gets more clicks so to some extent i think it's a natural consequence of the of the clickbait world we live in i, I call them the master baiters the master clickbaiters um so i think i think it's a little bit of both um so Mark asks, I didn't understand this question, Mark, is there a way to sort into a few categories? I think that there are different categories of attacks on Tesla. And I am, I've talked about this and I'm actually thinking about this. I want to build, I have, a, I have an idea for the way we should handle FUD in the future, negative stories from media in the future. There's an incident, there's a car crash, something happens and the media starts lying about Tesla. So my theory is we shouldn't, engage with the negative media we shouldn't drive more clicks to them we shouldn't read their articles we should identify what's the topic so for example it's tesla safety there was a crash they're saying tesla's unsafe and we should focus our activity on social media whatever we do my youtube videos whatever we do on twitter we should try to focus on what are the positive stories that relate to that let's tell stories about Te so if, for example if it's about safety let's tell stories about tesla safety let's talk about how teslas have the best crash ra crash ratings Let's talk about how Tesla have the lowest accident rates. Let's focus on the positives and not engage. Let's not drive clicks to the masturbators. Let's not give them, let's not reward them. Actually, one of the things I do on Twitter when I do engage with some negatives is I no longer post a link to the article. I take a screenshot and I post that, which doesn't link to their article because I don't want to reward them with clicks. Um, and I think it's important to do that. 
But I think there, there's this tendency for us to attack. And by attacking, we end up driving more clicks to them. They get more engagement and they, they keep doing it. So if we respond by not responding directly, but re do, do positives, I think that might be better. Um, Mark asks, does it naturally build from seeding the culture? I don't really understand what you mean by that. Uh, he referred to the LA Times article having a plain sight reference. For those who don't know, Plain Sight is a website that is run by a guy named Aaron Greenspan, who is a pure Tesla hater and Elon Musk hater. And he's suing Elon, he's suing Tesla, he's suing Omar. He's a nut. As far as I can tell, he's a nut. That's an opinion. I haven't diagnosed him with I haven't had been, not aware of any psychiatric diagnoses. Um but they will use somebody like Plain Sight, who's clearly a Tesla hater, who would clearly shine um, shade his information to make it look negative towards Elon and Tesla. Um, using him as a source and then claiming you used a reliable source is just ridiculous. Um, so I think I pretty much answered Mark's question there. I just think the best, the best way of handling it is we, whenever we see negative stories about Tesla, we should tell positive stories about Tesla. Um, you know, quick dis if we address the negative at all, we would give a quick dismissal. That's obviously not true. The media is just playing it up. And then let's focus on the positives. The media likes to talk about negatives. Let's talk about the positives. So I, 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 I'm hoping I'm busy for the next week or so, a couple weeks, but I'm soon I'm hoping to build, start working on building a library, maybe talk with others about building a library. What are the positive stories on the different topics and engage with um, other, I'm going to call myself a leader now in the Twitter community, in the Tesla community. Um, and there's other people who are bigger leaders than me in the Tesla Twitter community, the Tesla community. Engage with Dave Lee, engage with Rob Mauer, Mauer from Tesla Daily, um, Stephen Mark Ryan. You know, there's a lot of great people who are supportive of Elon, supportive of Tesla. Try to engage with those people and say, hey, let's do positive stories. It's easy. It's tempting for me, right? I can make a video engaging with the FUD. And I can probably get clicks. I can probably get views. I can probably get attention. And, I, you know, so I get more views. I make more money. I don't make that much money from this anyway. So it's not that important. And I really think, you know, my goal is to, you know, I believe in Tesla. It's not like I'm, I mean, I, I'm biased because I own Tesla stock and I have a Cybertruck on order. Um, I, and it's not like I think Tesla's perfect or Elon's perfect. I've had, if you follow my channel, you know, I've had problems with solar roof. We just signed up to get a non-solar roof. Um, I don't think we're going, I, you know, it's a small chance we'll still get a Tesla solar roof, but it's not looking likely now. Maybe we'll do solar panels in a year or two. Um, so I'm, and I'm not happy with Tesla customer service, but to me, that's like a, you know, it seems like there are people who have one bad experience with Tesla and they just turn anti-Tesla. Okay. I had one bad experience with Tesla. So what? There's, you know, I'm still very positive about Tesla. Um, and I'm, you know, admittedly biased, but you know, I, I think we're telling the truth and they're lying. So maybe I'm biased, but maybe I'm right. Maybe we're right. Uh, Mark Slavin said, I'm not crazy about Elon on SNL. However, free advertising doesn't hurt the brand. I think there were some comments early on where people were critical of SNL. They didn't think it was good or whatever. So there's a saying in politics that all press is good press unless you're caught with a live boy or a dead girl. I think that's from Edward Edwards from uh, Louisiana. But, you know, if you're getting press at all, it means you're raising your brand awareness. And as long as it's not terrible, then you're raising your brand awareness. And going on SNL builds Tesla's brand, builds SpaceX's brand, builds Elon's brand. Generally speaking, leads to positives. Are there people who are going to say negative things? No matter what you do, people are going to say negative things. I think this was a really good move. Um, I'm going to address this question from Beacon. Is that why you're not pushing for a Gordon Johnson debate conversation? Um, I could see myself still doing some interviews with uh, negative people about Tesla. Um, Gordon Johnson is somebody I particularly do not want to interview because I don't think you can have a, a reasonable conversation. I've watched people speak with him before, and I don't think you can have a reasonable conversation with him because he just literally doesn't answer the question. He talks about whatever he wants to talk about. He'll, he'll tell 10 lies in a row really fast, and you can't interrupt him. And if you interrupt him, somebody says you're rude. This is something I've noticed when I do these interviews. If I interrupt somebody, they say I'm rude. Well, if I don't interrupt him, they can tell 10 lies, and now i got to go back and go deal with all 10 lies. Interrupt him after the first lie. Um, I don't think Gordon Johnson, I think enough of them have seen what I've done to their, their elites that they're not going to come on my channel anymore anyway. But yeah, I kind of think maybe it doesn't make sense to do those interviews anymore. You know, if I had the opportunity to interview somebody, I don't think Gordon Johnson, 
somebody who I thought wasn't being fair to Tesla, would I do it? Probably. But, you know, it wouldn't be friendly. And so far, I, I think they're probably not going to do it anymore. Um, but Gordon Johnson in particular, I don't think it's possible to have a reasonable conversation with him because he just, he, somebody called it Gish Gallup. I'm not claiming I understand it, but he has this technique where you just can't really do it. He can't have a sensible conversation with the guy. So, uh, Stefan said, I just did a Google search about Tesla news. Over 80% were negative, only 10% positive. So it's definitely an issue. So yeah, there's, you know, again, that's the media FUD problem. I, I think the other thing I would say on this is, okay, there's a lot of negative news about Tesla and it outweighs the positive news in the media about Tesla. But don't forget that not that many people, it may be that not that many people are reading those stories. Uh, there's a lot of positive stuff on Twitter. Elon has 53, 54 million followers. When he tweets stuff, it's all positive. There's a bunch of people like me who are putting YouTube videos out. A lot of people are watching our videos. We're getting probably getting a million views a week between me and Rob Moore and Dave Lee, Stephen Mark Ryan, uh, Now You Know channel. There's a bunch of us doing a lot of these videos. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm leaving some people out. Uh, li uh, limiting factor. You put all our videos together, we might be getting a million views a week. Um, on Twitter, we're getting probably, you know, million, you know, engagements, a million, we're reaching a million people a week on Twitter. Don't underestimate what we're doing on social media. It's a lot bigger than you think. And don't overestimate what they're doing in regular media. Um, you know, people, yeah, a lot of people read the New York Times. How many of them read their Tesla articles? You know, half of these, you know, websites publish articles and people read the first couple paragraphs and move on and it doesn't have a big impact. I'm not, I'm not convinced that it's that damaging. So Stefan says he would like to hear more about the status of the 4680 cells and its rollout, which model first and where? That's a really good question. Um, my sense of 4680 is that it's going well. It's kind of tricky with the Q1 call because Elon seemed negative, but Drew still seemed positive. It was a rare moment where Elon didn't seem upbeat. James Dalma thought, you know, Elon must have had, been having an off day. Um, everything I've heard from Drew, they're either ahead of schedule, they're on schedule. Uh, it seems like they expect to start making cells in some volume, not huge volumes, but in some volume by the end of this year, putting them in cars. What cars are they going in? Well, I think they're going in. This is a paradox because if you watch the battery day presentation, Model Y is supposed to be getting the high nickel, the nickel manganese cells and not the high nickel cells. But it appears they're building 4680 high nickel cell lines in Berlin and Austin. And the first vehicles they're going to be producing out of Berlin and Austin are Model Y. So my guess is they're going to have a high performance or a special high end version of Model Y coming out of Berlin and Texas. And that's the first thing that's going to use. Well, Semi is going to be the first thing using. 4680 cells, the high nickel cells. Cybertruck will be using them, but I think that's in 2022. I think Cybertruck is pretty clearly now pushed off to 2022. There's a, there's a chance they're sandbagging and Cybertruck will deliver before the end of the year, but I don't think so. I think based on what Zach Kirkhorn said at the Q1 call, the fact that they didn't talk about Cybertruck at the Q1 call, I think it's pretty clear they're not going to be delivering Cybertruck until early 2022 at the earliest. And I, I'm one of the first orders, so I'm I got a lot invested in that. I want my Cybertruck. So as far as I can tell, everything looks good with 4680 cells. Drew said that they're, Drew Baglino said that they're achieving good, reasonable yields. I think there were reliability issues with the batteries. There's things they got to work on, but they're iterating, they're iterating, they're iterating. And once they get to a certain point in Fremont on those cell lines, they've already started moving equipment into Berlin and Texas. Once they feel like they've got the process down in Fremont, then they just export that process to Berlin and Texas and start producing cells there as well. And Elon said something about 12 to 18 months to volume production. I think he meant 12 to 18 months to ramp to full volume because he has said that before that it typically takes 12 to 18 months to ramp to full volume. So I think he's expecting, I think, I think we are expecting 4680 production to begin in, in earnest, some significant 4680 production I'm guessing third third quarter this year, August, September, maybe October, that we start seeing significant volumes of those cells being produced and they start going in Tesla Semi and they start going into early Model Ys. Um, that's what I think is coming. Um, I think fourth quarter is when we see Model Ys start getting produced in Berlin in volume, in some volume in Berlin and Texas. There may be an early Model Y coming out of Berlin in, say, July, in uh, June, let's say. 
but I think it's really, or July or something like that, but I really think they're going to start doing significant volumes of those in the fourth quarter. Um, so, Ken Switzer says he wanted my comments on future copper issues for Tesla. He linked to a video, which I haven't looked at yet. Um, there's been a lot of questions about materials. <clears throat> I don't think there's ever going to be a significant copper problem for Tesla. I, I think what we're seeing is there are increases in some materials costs. Generally speaking, there's people think there's no inflation. There's a lot of inflation. There's a lot of inflation in materials costs. So there have been price increases in some Tesla vehicles. I think that's partly driven by demand, and it's partly driven by cost of materials. The cost of copper is going up. The cost of steel is going up. There is apparently a fair amount of copper in a Tesla vehicle. There's copper in the batteries. There's copper in the wiring. But um, I don't think it's going to be a huge issue for Tesla. I think the, the cost of the copper in a car is probably in the low hundreds of dollars. The cost of steel in Cybertruck is going to be more significant, right? Because Cybertruck has got 700 plus pounds, probably 1,000 pounds of steel in it or something. So that's going to go up. Um, but, you know, I don't think steel is so cheap that it doesn't add up to that much. You know, if you double the cost of steel, it's still not that significant a component of the cost of the car. So, you know, is it, does it have an impact? Yes. Does it raise price a few hundred bucks? Yes. Is it that big of a deal? No. Um, David says, I'd love to hear more about SpaceX, Starship, SN15, and what impact Starlink will have on rural areas. So those are different topics. I think I covered SpaceX and SN15 earlier, so I'm just going to go to Starlink's impact. There are large parts of the world where people don't have good internet access. And even people who can afford good internet access just don't have good internet access. My cousin actually got his Starlink finally in southern New Hampshire, and it's a big improvement. And it's basically going to improve people's access to the internet, It's going, which is going to, for wealthy people, not a huge deal. They're already wealthy. But you add that to, just leave the cap off the water bottle. Thank you, Tim. All right, I'll leave the cap off the water bottle. It's a habit, Tim. I don't know. I, I don't know if I can stop. Um... I think the bigger impact for Starlink potentially is if they're able to get the cost down and they're able to deliver a package where let's say some rural village in India can use Starlink and they can share it. And so 10 families can share one Starlink connection and it doesn't cost them that much money and it makes them much more productive and allows them to earn a better living for their families and bring more people out of poverty. There's a lot of, there's still, even though we've made great strides in, in the world, in humanity of bringing people out of poverty, I think probably the biggest impact will be providing, I mean, it's big for other people, you know, there's people who want faster internet access who are gonna get more value out of it, but for people who have very limited internet access and, and are poor, the opportunity this creates for them to get better education through online education, for them to do work through uh, good internet connections, a lot of potential for that. So, and then Jay, Jay Lizard asked for a discussion on the genius of Nikolai Tesla. I do not know much about Nikolai Tesla, so I'm not going to address that one. The threat of noiseless cars on animals in nature. I don't know enough about that. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think that animals are already threatened by cars that make noises. Their animals are already killed by cars that make noises. I'm not convinced that the, that the noise is going to be a significant factor in that. Um... This was a good question that I'd like to know the answer to. Who is the entity that owns the 28% of Doge? Is he an ally of Elon and Mark Cuban? I don't, I, th I think Elon said that there's like five individuals or five small, you know, institutions who own something like 80% of Doge. So, and you know, one of Elon's criticisms is if Doge really wants to be serious, they have to achieve true decentralization, which means the people who have large stakes in Doge needs to sell it, need to sell it. So, um, I think that's the best answer I have. I, I don't know who it is. I don't know who owns Doge. I wouldn't be surprised if that information is out there, but I haven't seen it. Oh, Brooke Chen asked, I'm going to take this question quick. Brooke Chen asked, could you explain more specifically how Starlink could reach $5 trillion in market cap? Sure, Brooke. I have a video on the channel. If you go down, you search my channel for four minutes, or Starlink, I think. I address this specifically, but... Suppose Starlink has 100 million customers and they're each paying $1,000 a month on average. That's $100 billion in revenue. The cost of 
getting Starlink up and operating at a surprisingly low. I think at the extreme, it might cost $10 billion to operate to serve $100 billion in revenue. So you got $90 billion in profit right there. Figure there's some other factors going on and you lower it to 50 billion. You give it a price earnings multiple of 30, you get to 1.5 trillion. That's where I was when I made that video. And then I saw a, a story the next day that the market for Starlink in the United States alone was 65 million customers. So I think the global market for Starlink might be 300 million. So in other words, triple my previous numbers, right? If you triple my previous numbers, you get to basically a $5 trillion market cap on Starlink alone. That's how you get there. And you know, there's a theory that, okay, well, Amazon is going to put up their competitive satellite network, but they can't compete on cost. It costs Star SpaceX so little to launch. SpaceX's launch costs are really low. They've got their manufacturing, their satellites down really cheap. I don't think there's going to be a lot of opportunities for others to cut in. I think the first mover advantage for Starlink is going to be really huge. And I just don't think we're going to see com competition for it. Um, in a meaning, and there's already competition on Earth, you know, fiber optic networks in the cities. Elon has said that Starlink will not succeed in cities. It will not succeed in urban environments because it's too dense and it can't work in that dense human environment. But it will make a huge difference. Um, okay, so Jay Lizard asked, what corporation is Tesla most likely to purchase? I have not really paid attention to that. Um, I guess my big guess there is Lyft. That if Tesla wants to deliver a self-driving car network, that it would make sense to buy a self a self-driving company, that there may be some intellectual property that Uber and Lyft have that would be valuable to Tesla for building out a, a self-driving car network. And Lyft would be cheaper than Uber and probably has about the same level of information that Uber has. I mean, Uber would have more data, but Uber would be a lot more expensive. I don't think that's gonna happen. That's my best guess. And Jay Lizard also asked for a discussion on the type of tires Tesla uses. As far as I know, Tesla uses ordinary tires. I, I'm not aware of anything special about the tires yet. I believe that going forward for the 2023 vehicle that they talked about at Battery Day, I think they're going to use a low rolling resistance tire. My own theory is that they're going to go down to like 14 or 15 inch wheels instead of 18 inch wheels. They're going to go for much lower cost wheels and tires, lower mass wheels and tires that will make the car more efficient. Um, they probably will be able to get to 100,000 mile tires with 100,000 miles of life. So that the cost of operating your robo taxi goes down a lot on a per mile basis and you're able to deliver rides for or you're able to make more profit on the price of a dollar a mile or whatever you'll but you'd actually be able to deliver rides profitably for well under 50 cents a mile so that's the the patreon and uh youtube questions you know again check the links below to support this channel on patreon or to uh join the youtube channel uh, join the YouTube channel, exclusive content member above. You can participate in that part. Now I'm going to turn to the audience questions. And just to be clear, this is Mother's Day. I am bringing my mother home from the assisted living facility and we have other family coming over. So I will not be running as long today as usual. It's going to be, we got to probably, I'll probably be around for another hour, but it, there's going to be some limit on how much I can do. So let's see if we have questions here. Eric Mulder says the top 20 Dogecoin holders own 50% of the supply. I believe it. And this, this is a problem. I just read a report. Uh, Jason DeBolt posted this, tweeted this report on Dogecoin that there's a lot of issues. with. Uh, check out Jason DeBolt on Twitter. Um, in the last two or three days, he did this tweet with a report on Dogecoin that I thought was pretty impressive at, you know, the positives and negatives of Dogecoin. Eric says, how will states generate? Oh, and I'm going to switch here to run the chat Q&A now. Eric Mulder says, how many, how will states, Eric says, you know, Tesla should purchase Gigapress manufacturer Idra. I'm not sure that Tesla is going to need that many Gigapresses that it would make sense to buy Idra. That's an Italian company that makes the Gigapresses. I, I think that they're going to be building out a few factories and then they're done. And I'm not sure whether they would need more Gigapresses after they build out five more factories. Maybe. Um, Eric says, how will states generate revenue to make up for FSD and lower vehicle violations? So well, <laughs> I like the way you phrased it, Eric. This is classic. You phrased it as generate revenue as if the problem was revenue. Maybe the problem is spending. So my answer would be, well, if there's fewer vehicle violations, we don't need to spend so much money on police and prosecutors and public defenders and courts. Let's write fewer tickets and then let's save money by having fewer people in the jobs that we're doing that. 
We can eliminate DM. What, you know, if we go full on FSD robo taxi world, we're not going to need people getting driver's licenses anymore. We can get rid of DMV jobs. The answer shouldn't be how do we replace the revenue? The answer should be how can we cut the spending? And that's my response. What will they actually do? Uh, we're seeing signs of states, I think it was Montana, Australia, taxing EVs. I, I don't understand it. The goal shouldn't be to add more revenue. The goal should be cut spending. Um, Sean asks, do I think Tesla, oh, so currently 4680 cell production is producing many bad cells. Do you think Tesla is also perfecting methods to recycle 4680 cells in parallel with cell creation? Um, they pretty clearly said they're working on, uh, recycling. Um, I think that recycling is still going to be at a fairly low, small scale at this point, but yeah, they're probably doing some recycling of the materials in the cells already. Um, and, uh, you know, Redwood Materials, uh, J.B. Straubel was the chief technology officer. He started a startup for battery recycling. I believe Tesla has its own in-house recycling. Um, and I think that it, it actually happens in any cell production that there's going to be bad cells. The question is how much yield. It's called yield. So if half the cells are good and half the cells are bad, you have 50% yield. So the goal is to get to 90 plus percent yield. And I think they will get there. And I think right now they might be around 50%. Based on what my, I heard from Drew Baglino, I think they're getting close to 50% yield. And as they improve the yield, the cost per battery cell comes down. Um, let's see. Was Elon funny or not last night, Warren? Uh, John Jacobs asked. Yes, I thought Elon was funny. Was he the, as funny as the funniest host ever? No. I thought he was funny. I thought he had some particularly funny moments. Uh, let's see. What do we got? One good argument. Let's see. Who gets the driving without a license for a robo taxi? Yeah. I mean, I just don't think we, there's going to be need for these tickets. What is the probability that Starlink splits off for purposes of IPO instead of going public as SpaceX? Tony asks. So Tony, I think it's pretty clear that SpaceX is not going to go public, but that's, and that Starlink will split off in an IPO. I think Gwyn Shotwell has said it. Elon has said not yet, but it's pretty clear that it's going to happen as long as Starlink is able to succeed, as long as it succeeds and actually makes money. I think within the next two or three years, we're going to see Starlink spin off as an IPO. Um, and depending on what it's priced at, you know, if, if I'm correct and it's going to be a trillion dollar plus company, then if they spin it off at a, at a billion dollar, a hundred billion dollar valuation, I'm buying. Um, this is not investment advice. Do you have any info on the new factory in China that will make charging stations? John, I think the new factory in China is already up and making charging stations. I think they announced that that factory is already producing. Um, that's what I saw. Let's get it on, says SN15 was awesome start to finish. Have they announced what caused the fire on landing yet? I think the fire on landing is an inevitable result of the fact that there's a lot of, there's this chamber underneath Starship. There's this pocket of air, there's this space. and there's methane coming out of those engines and uh it you know it's not the first time it's happened so i think i think even if you watch falcon 9 landing sometimes you'll see a little bit of flame at the end and that's a different fuel so i everything i've seen they're not worried about it right so it's, it's sort of like there's a fire but that fire isn't necessarily a problem it may be a small issue i think there it was kind of funny because the announcer for spacex said there's a small fire and i think the fire was like 30 or 40 feet high and he called it a small fire so i thought that was funny but um what are my thoughts on tesla creating an ai robot with vision training for package delivery with their delivery vans will they be the next amazon or focus only on delivery so active 789 check the video the james dalma video that i linked in the description below um we talked about that at uh i think it was around 214 in the video or we started talking about robots around 205, two hours and five minutes into that video. And so I would say there was about 10 or 15 minutes in there. I will be putting up a video about that, hopefully this week, where I sort of summarize, um, you know, clip out the, the slow parts of that video and make it down to a 20 minute video or 15 minute video. Have I heard anything about Toyota taking up FSD in their EVs? I have not heard anything and I highly doubt that Toyota is taking Tesla FSD in its EVs. Justin Bartley says, will the FSD regulators go with the levels model for approval? That's a good question, Justin. I think that it is something that the regulators look at, but I think the levels model is just, it's level, 
look, it either it's either level five or it isn't. Maybe there's some sort of room for level four that in certain circumstances you're allowed to operate as a robo taxi. Um, I'm not convinced that regulators are able to stop FSD from operating, and it depends on the state that you're in. I think that in Florida, if Tesla says we have a self-driving car, Florida law already says, okay, go. I don't know that there's a spot. I don't know where the regulatory hurdle is that would stop Tesla from operating a self-driving car once Tesla thinks it's an okay car. Um, James Dalma's position was that the, the point of the levels is to distinguish who's responsible if there's an accident. If it's level two and you're supposed to be paying attention, then you're responsible if the car has an accident. If it's level four or five and the vehicle is driving, then the, then the manufacturer is responsible if there's an accident. I actually disagree with James. I didn't bring it up in the, in the, on the conversation with him. I think if you're relying on FSD, even though it's called level two and there's an accident, then if I'm a personal injury lawyer, I'm suing Tesla because they got more money than you do. And I'm not convinced that case gets thrown out. Do I think Elon will give free one-way tickets to Mars for Jeff Bezos, Gordon Johnson, Bob Lutz, and Trevor Milton? Well, first of all, Jeff Bezos doesn't need a free ticket. Um, I don't think he cares about Trevor Milton. I don't think, I, I don't know. I don't think Elon's going to do any of that. Um, did we mention that the Falcon 9 fleet leader reached 10 life landings last night? That was in the, the SpaceX part of the, that was in the SpaceX part of the video. I covered that in the SpaceX part of the video, Thaddeus. Um, have I checked out Arrival? I did check out Arrival. I, I, Arrival is a company for people who don't know that is purporting to build like vans, electric vehicle vans in these micro factories that'll make in small volume. I'm not convinced that that business model works. The vehicles did not have a lot of range. Oh, Brooke Chen says, what are my thoughts on what could be Tesla's master plan part three? Did I see Stephen Mark Ryan's recent video on it? No, I did not see Stephen's video. Um, I have not thought about a master plan part three. I think it's an interesting concept, but I think, I don't know if there's going to be a master plan part three. I think Elon has talked about AI and robotics. I think it's pretty clear that whatever part three is or whatever's coming, robotics are going to be a big part of it. When's the updated model? Um, I was hoping to do a model if I started working on a model for 2026. I haven't finished it yet. Um, I don't think I'm going to get it done this week. So that video is probably not happening. Just, um, my daughter's home from college. I'm spending time with my daughter, spending time with family. So this week I'm going to edit that James Dalma video and post clip videos from that. Um, so hopefully the following week I'll get that video up. Won't early Starship test flights packed with Starlink satellites just make SpaceX advantages uncatchable? So, uh, and thank you, Marty, for the question. Um, I've talked about this before. Once Starship is launching Starlink, Currently, Falcon 9 launches 60 Starlinks at a cost of somewhere around $50 million. Maybe it's $30 million, let's say. So let's call it $30 million. That's about $50,000 a satellite. Once Starship is launching them, Starship is going to carry 400 of them. And Starship is going to do it for ultimately $2 million in cost. So the, cost, the launch cost is going to drop from $50,000 a satellite to $5,000 a satellite. That doesn't include the cost of... That doesn't include the cost of um, the satellite. So one of the questions is, can they get the cost of the satellites down? I believe they're mass producing the satellites. They may get the cost of the satellites down to $100,000. So this is why I think Starlink is so profitable, is if you need to launch 8,000 satellites a year to maintain your network, and it costs you $100,000 a satellite, let's say it's 9,000 satellites and it costs you a little over $100,000 a satellite, you're basically talking about a billion dollars a year. That's it. Not that expensive. It's crazy, but it's not that expensive. I think my numbers are right there. 9,000 times 100,000 would be 900,000. Or 9,000 9, times 100 would be 900 million. Add a little more, it's a billion dollars. A billion dollars a year to make $100 billion a year in profit. I mean, $100 billion in revenue, it's crazy. It's crazy how much value there is there. Um, what did Bruce Banner say? Yield and production rate are directly correlated. If yield rates are low, they will not produce cells at a high rate until yield comes up. Production is slower, but yield is getting high quickly. Yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't know if we really know how much, how fast yield is improving, but I think it's improving, Bruce. Bruce, uh, Bruce is somebody uh, I, I encounter a lot on 
clubhouse and bruce is a very very thoughtful guy he's very uh helpful information oh jarno thank you for your support um yeah, everybody's asking about the 2026 model video it's going to be a couple weeks do i think fsd will be required to pass a driver's license test in every state that's funny tramp fossil so i would say the odds are that fsd would pass a driver's license test and that's actually the kind of the funny thing is that if that was the if that was all they had to do then it would be really easy to get fsd working you could like game the system to make it pass the test and to some extent that's what i think happens with some human drivers can i comment on when or if falcon 9 this is from tony when and if falcon 9 reached cost parity especially now that it's landed 10 times i'm not sure what you mean cost tony i'm not sure what you mean by cost parity parity with what um if you mean I think that landing the rockets, I think the second launch is already reducing costs. The second time you launch the rocket, you're already saving money. So I, I don't, I'm not really sure I understand your question. I mean, Falcon 9 was already cheaper than anybody else before they, before they started reusing them. Oh, Amit Bahadur, RoboTaxi or Dear Moon Mission, which do you think will happen first? RoboTaxi will happen first. Dear Moon Mission is 2023 at the earliest. RoboTaxi will happen, in my opinion, in 2022, if not the end of this year. Declan Murphy, hey Warren, did you love the Cybertruck styling from the very start? It took me a while, but now I think it's one of the best designs ever. Declan is someone else that I interact with on Clubhouse a lot. Um, I ordered in the first hour, so yes, I loved, I loved it. I would say I'm more motivated by the functionality than I am by the styling. I like the styling, but I love the functionality of Cybertruck. I love that it's bulletproof. I love that it's an EV. I love the practicality of it. You know, if you buy a regular pickup truck, number one, they cost a lot of money. And that's another thing. Cybertruck's pretty reasonably priced if you compare it to pickups. But, you know, pickup trucks get terrible gas mileage. So you just spend a huge amount of money on gas and they don't last. You know, they, if you take care of them, they last a long time. But, you know, you're going to have a lot of expenses taking care of them. Cybertruck's going to be lower maintenance. It's going to be great. Um, Jarno asks, how would you try to get in contact with Tesla? If you'd had a very good patent for them, I have no idea how to do that. Jar, I get cast all the time from people. How do I get in touch with Elon? How do I get in touch with with Tesla? I don't know. I don't have any kind of contact with them. I I couldn't get in touch with them meaningfully on my solar roof, and I had I had trouble getting a hold of them for that. When will Cybertruck be in the EU in the European Union? Will it be before Model Two? So I don't believe there is a Model Two. I don't like that term. Um, I call it the 2023 Robo Taxi, the 2023 Compact. Cybertruck in the European Union, I think that's probably 2024. Uh, I'm not sure whether they're going to export any American Cybertrucks to Europe, American made ones. And then model the 2023 compact will be 2023. So I think that'll be first. Yeah, Jim Whitehead says you need ground stations and some support. So call it $2 billion in cost per year. I agree with that. I mean, it's not just the launch costs. You got marketing costs, you got customer service costs. There's going to be a lot of costs with Starlink, but. It's hard to get to $10 billion a year in expenses for this thing. And it's not hard to see getting to $100 billion a year in revenue. So it's a massive uh, increase and in, in, it's a massive profit model. Does Elon have Asperger's or was he joking? I think he has Asperger's. I don't know. I mean, I, I would have guessed that beforehand. Should all Tesla taxis have biohazard air filtration? I believe all Tesla vehicles already effectively have air filtration at some level and i think you just have to turn the fan speed up and you get the equivalent what interviews do you have lined up i don't remember having any more interviews lined up i may have more coming there's a guy from uh who's formerly from nasa who's a cousin of a friend of mine who i've talked about interviewing there's a venture capitalist a uh, nice young woman from in new york city who has her own venture capital firm that i've talked about interviewing but i haven't really put a lot of effort into that um I really want to make edited videos and the, 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 the interview videos just seem to happen. I don't have any thoughts on and New York City taxi fleet expansion. I think it'll happen, but I think robo taxis are going to displace taxis overall. Let me just read this one. The Wealth Journey says, With Starlink, imagine if the satellites create a mesh around the whole world and can provide a constant service with no need to change networks, have different usernames, passwords, always connected. That's the plan. I think, I'm not sure how good the coverage is going to be at the North and South Poles. I think Close to the North Pole, close to the South Pole, the coverage may not be that good, but everywhere else on Earth, 
there should be reliable coverage on the oceans pretty much anywhere as long as it's allowed by the country the gov the country the government in the country where you are um how do i think about holding tesla long term versus age and quality of life Brian, I'm not sure I understand your question about holding Tesla long term versus age and quality of life. I don't really understand what you mean, Brian. Um, if you mean I'm holding it too long and I'm going to be too old to enjoy my money later, I'm not sure what you mean by that. I think I've answered all the questions that I can see. So, do I think they will offer a variable accent for the robo taxi voice? Yes, probably. It'll probably be something that'll be built into the app on your phone. Just like right now for Google Maps, I can choose what accent I have on my on the voice on my phone. I think I could see that being part of the Tesla app so that the car knows what accent you want. Um, I know, Thaddeus, there's supposed to be polar satellites, but every coverage map I've seen, there isn't good coverage of, of the North and South Pole. Not a lot of demand there. How's the soundproof doghouse coming along? That is actually a video I'm hoping to make soon. Um, I've made a fair bit of progress on the soundproof doghouse. There is a dog, there is a, a door for the dog to go through. I have put the intern, I put cork on the inside of the doghouse and I've started putting foam panels on the outside of the doghouse. I have a friend who's a YouTuber. Her name is Dr. Lindsay Butzer. She lives in my area and I'm working on having her come over so I can have her as like a consultant. We're going to make a video talking about the doghouse. Um, so I think that's coming two weeks. Maybe three weeks we'll be doing that video. That's going to be fun. Dr. Lin Look up Dr. Lindsay Butzer, B-U-T-Z-E-R. She's on YouTube. She's on Instagram. Um, recovering from cancer. Brilliant young woman. Really fun. Uh, her father's a, been a local veterinarian here for years, and she became a veterinarian. Uh, really sweet young woman. So, Brian says, yes, was it, he was wondering if I ever had a cash out date on Tesla stock. I don't have a cash out date on Tesla. It's actually kind of interesting. I've seen people talking about you don't actually sell your stock, you borrow against your stock. I haven't persuaded myself that's the right path yet. I'm gonna have to look at that. But I don't intend to use, whether it's borrowing against the stock or selling the stock, I do not plan on selling my Tesla stock until 2030. Now, I've mentioned, we, people have been asking about the 2026 model. If my 2026 model that I'm working on is correct, then Tesla stock is going to go up really fast somewhere between now and 2026. My theory is that I'm going to take a step back for a second. Years ago, I was interested in internet hardware. It's an investing in internet hardware companies. And I was looking at Cisco Systems, CSCO. That was the stock ticker at the time. I don't even follow the company anymore. And it was really, really high price. The price earnings ratio was insanely high. What happened was there was this sentiment on Wall Street that you want to be with the, the big company. You want to, that there's a, like a, there was a price premium for the top company in the field. So I thought it was overpriced. It probably still went up, but I thought it was overpriced. And I looked around and I found a couple companies that were in the same rough space, F5 Networks and Foundry Networks, that didn't have the same price premium because they weren't the top company in the field. So I was able to buy stock in those companies cheaper and I made a lot of those. Those were very good investments. I didn't buy as much as I should have. That's my, 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 my most common investment mistake was I didn't buy enough of something I thought was a good investment. I made like five, F5 networks. I think I 5 x on that stock. So the thing about that I think is going to happen, potentially happen with Tesla is right now, you'll still see sentiments in the media and on Wall Street that Tesla is not the big player. Yes, it's got the biggest market cap, but Toyota makes, makes 10 times as many cars or 20 times as many cars. And there's going to come a time where Tesla, and I think by 2026, Tesla, I, my, my model for 2026, I, I think Tesla might make 18 million cars in 2026. Okay, that's, where this, that's where the 2026 model is going, that we're going to hit 5 million cars by 2024, if not 2023. And then the 2023 compact factories, are gonna, the ones that was promoted at Battery D, those factories are going to come online and those are going to be very, very highly productive factories. And they're going to spit out vehicles at a rate of 4 million a year each. And there's going to be three of those. That's 12 million. Add that to the 6 million from the existing factories. You've got 18 million vehicles a year. So if by 2026, Tesla has reached the point where it's producing more vehicles than anybody else, and it's making substantial profits, then I think there's a point somewhere in there where the Wall Street slash media sentiment shifts. And Tesla is now unquestionably the top dog, the biggest player. 
and it becomes a sort of like, well, you got to hold Tesla. And it leads to a price premium where right now I believe Tesla is massively undervalued, underpriced compared to its actual value. That anybody thinking that Tesla's worth $700 a share is just not looking at where this company is going. To me, there's no question that Tesla today is worth $2,500 a share. So by 2026, if they're producing 18 million, million vehicles, they're making huge profits, then not only will the profit story be higher and obviously values, the price is going to go up because of that, but it could overshoot because Wall Street and the media have all of a sudden shifted their perspective. And now all of a sudden Tesla is the big player. If it overshoots in, let's say, 2020, by 2026, if it is overshot and I think it's worth $20,000 a share and the market is valued at $40,000 a share, well, yeah, then I'm going to sell some. I mean, ultimately, I think it goes higher than that. But, you know, if it gets to the point where it's overshot what I think its real value is, I might sell then. I just, you know, you have to see. And then there sort of has to be, okay, if I'm going to sell that, where am I putting my money next? Right? You know, and I, look, I sold Apple early. <laughs> right? I made money on Apple but I sold earlier than I should have. So um, I don't want to sell too early, but if I, the question is going to be at that point, and so let's say it's 2026, let's say I'm right and it's it's shot up in value and, and everything's happened. Is there somewhere else I want to put my money? Because the thing is, if it, if it goes to $20,000 a share, I'm going to have more money than I know what to do with and I'm not going to spend it. I can't see myself spending that much. So it's not really going to matter. Um, so, I, you know, I'll, I'll probably sell some stock in 2026 if it if, if it does what I think it's going to do. So, great. All right, let me go back to questions here. Pass on your stocks to your children without paying tax. So a line of credit against your stock is a really good idea. Interesting. Hadn't thought of that. It is true. Most of my stock is in an IRA. So, or all my stock is in an IRA. Some of the stock that I will have will not be in an IRA. Um, so my... My IRA will pass to my kids. So I'm not sure that has the same impact. Nelson asks public relations for Tesla. Why not? So Nelson, I'm not sure if you saw it. I posted, a, I tweeted a meme on Twitter this week. Maybe I, I don't know if I mentioned that last week. Maybe it was this week. And Elon replied to my tweet. Um, I thought I did that last week. Uh, where I just talked about the public relations problem. Maybe it was this week and I should have included it. Basically, there's two scenarios for what happens when there's a bad event related to Tesla or an event related to Tesla, whether it's bad or not. There's an event. The media misreports the event in a negative light to Tesla in both versions of this story. In one version of the story, Tesla does not have a public relations department, and that's the end of the story. Something happens, the media misreports it, story dies. Tesla has a public relations department. The public relations department does some kind of press release or some kind of story to try to engage the media and the media then misreports the public relations department's version of events. So they get another free whack at Tesla because the public relations department tried to get a better message out and the media used that to attack Tesla again. So that's my take on why Tesla doesn't need a PR department and shouldn't have a PR department. Now, somebody has actually talked about government relations as opposed to media relations. And I have my own theory about government relations. Elonbits.com. My theory on government relations is this is cold hearted, but Tesla should hire former members of Congress and former senators. Pay them a quarter million a year, half a million a year, whatever. And the job is just to take sitting members of Congress and senators out to out to lunch or dinner. And maybe they can't pay, but they take them out to dinner. They and all they do is they buy them dinner and they tell them how great Tesla's treating them. They don't talk about policy at all. There's no policy comp. Not one bit of policy conversation. They just keep telling them how great Tesla's treating them. Boy, it's so great. You know, I, I left Congress. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I got this gig with Tesla and it's part time and I can do other things and they pay me all this money and I have a great time. And it's basically sending a message to the members of Congress that if you treat Tesla okay, then there'll be a job for you when you leave Congress. Is it right? No. But is it bad compared to what else goes on in Congress? No. And then maybe you have, you know, lobbyists. You know, I hate to say it, but you have the 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 cute girl who's in her 20s, wears, you know, short skirts, and she goes into the con congressman's office the next day to talk about policy issues, right? Maybe. I'm a little cynical there, if you haven't noticed. I hope that wasn't too offensive. Okay, so Rob Markovich says, Warren, regarding public relations, so many articles state they've reached out to Tesla for a comment, but no one was available. Wouldn't it be nice to get a quote from Tesla in these FUD articles? 
So, Rob, you're assuming that the quote would be reported faithfully. You're assuming that the that the media would not twist whatever Tesla said. I think that's incorrect. And, you know, an example is this Texas accident. We didn't know what happened yet. The media ran with a story without any information. They had some wisp, this hint of information from some deputy saying they weren't wearing seatbelts. No one was in the driver's seat to, aha, autopilot was driving. Tesla couldn't have known at that point whether autopilot was driving or not. They would say, well, we don't think it works that way, but they wouldn't have had the right information. You don't want to say it wasn't driving and then find out it was. They don't want to give, you don't want to give false information. So it just wasn't, it wasn't going to work. You're, I think, Mar Rob, I think your mistake, in my opinion, your mistake is you think that the media actually cares about the truth, right? You think that there's a significant portion of the media that actually wants to get the truth out there. And I think that the vast majority of the media have zero interest in reporting the truth. They want to get clicks. They want to get, you know, sell ads. They're getting paid off by the fossil fuel industry or the car industry, whatever it is. I think there's a very, very small portion of the indus of the media that actually cares about getting the story right. And if they wanted to get the story right, then if they didn't hear from Tesla, they would go to Rob Moore. Rob, Rob is sort of an unofficial spokesman for the Tesla community. They could have gone to Rob. Rob knows everything. They could have asked him. They could ask me. They could ask, you know, now you know channel. They could ask, you know, Zach and Jesse. There's all kinds of people they could ask if they wanted to get an opinion on this outside of their bullshit source, and they don't care. Tesla short shorts, that's right. It's the short shorts. Um, hot Android robots, yes. Um, any thoughts on the predicted stock market crash talked about lately? I didn't I'm not aware of anybody talking about a particular crash coming. I think there's a lot of bad things going on in society, um, and there's a lot of good things going on in society. I think that the government printing money has gotten out of control, and I think we may face a hyperinflation. Whether the hyperinflation causes a stock market crash or it causes asset price inflation, I'm not sure. I think we're already seeing some degree of significant inflation, which is causing commodity prices to go up. It's causing home prices to go up. It's causing stock prices to go up. Um, it's causing cryptocurrency prices to go up. Surprisingly, it hasn't caused gold to go up. Digital Blade CA says, where would the media go to in order to get the facts if they don't understand the details, assuming they are not malicious? I don't assume they're not malicious. I assume they are malicious. I believe that there are exceptions. But the answer to that question, plain and simple, is they could go to Rob Moore. They could go to Jack and Zach and Jesse. They could come to me. There's lots of, uh, they could go to Dave Lee. There are a lot of people on Twitter. They could go to Arm Omar Kazi. There are a lot of people who are very knowledgeable about Tesla, more knowledgeable than me, frankly. Who could answer their questions if they actually wanted information um i i saw zach and jesse's video i don't agree it doesn't matter there's this idea that somehow it matters that this bad pr matters they, they sold out for cars in the second quarter it's only may right they're too they my neighbor ordered a model y they got to wait nine weeks to get nine weeks to get a model y the demand is through the roof they're not affecting demand Elon doesn't care about short-term share price. I don't care about short-term share price. I don't see what effect this is having. It's not a problem. Alejandro asks, how many gigapresses in use and how many are in order? So my understanding, Alejandro, is that, that uh, the Model Y factory in Berlin will have eight gigapresses, four for front castings, four for rear castings. I think it will be the same in Texas. Um, I believe there's one or two gigapresses in Fremont right now. I believe that there's a gigapress or two in Shanghai right now. And I think that they will be ordering gigapresses for the Model Y factory in Berlin and the Mo a Model Y factory in Texas. I believe there will be a separate larger gigapress. I think it's already on order for the Cybertruck for Texas. I'm not sure if there's any more. So Opzar says it's a constant war. The Tesla PR team would have to keep would have to keep responding to false info tweets incessantly, but hey, it's better than saying nothing. No, it's not. That's the point. When you say, <laughs> so I'm a criminal defense lawyer, right? Those who don't know, I wrote a book called Fair DUI, right? Fair DUI is a book that helps you in traffic stops. And one of the first principles is, the first material chapter is don't drink and drive. For those people who think I advocate drunk driving, but right here in the book, page 18, shut up, right? Anything you say, can and will be used against you in a court of law. Anything that Tesla says can and will be used against it in the court of the media. It, it, it's it, the, the, the idea that if you say something that will be helpful assumes that the people who are listening care about being objective. And I have come to the conclusion 
They do not care about being objective. They are not interested in truth. They are interested in slamming Tesla. Anything you say, can and will be used against you. Thank you, Carl. Carl gets it. Can I explain why the 30 mile per hour Tesla Texas crash burst into flames? No, we don't know what happened yet, Rick. I, I can't explain what happened in the Texas, Texas crash. It's usually two weeks before you get a report on a fatal crash. You know, look, there were probably 100, there's 30,000 or 40,000 fatal crashes a year in the United States. Okay, so that's roughly 100 a day. <laughs> 10 a day? I think it's 100 a day. There's 100 fatal crashes a day. Why aren't we, why aren't there news stories about the other 99 crashes that day? Why aren't there news stories about the 700 crashes that, that week? You know, why is there, why, this is ridiculous. Why doesn't Ford have to respond every time there's a Ford crash? That's why you know it's malicious. Free Kekistan. <laughs> I love that name. If we have an economic crash, do you think growth stocks are going to get hammered? I think there's a lot of different ways a crash can happen, so it's really hard to say. I think that companies that are succeeding in a that succeed in a crisis, which I think Tesla is one of them. I think companies that succeed in difficult we've seen this in COVID, right? Tesla outperformed during COVID. If there's a crisis, the companies that outperform will continue to do well. The companies that were growing but that can't handle a crisis will not do well. So, Alan Graybosch says, besides potentially India, where do you think the next Gigafactory gets built? So I think the three major New factories to be built will be in Texas, in Shanghai, and in Europe, possibly Berlin, depending on how Berlin treats Tesla. Um, I think there's a chance for a gigafactory in Japan, and I think a gigafactory in Japan is more likely than a gigafactory in India. I think Osaka, Japan is the fourth largest car market in the world. I think some kind of factory in India to produce something might be worthwhile, but the Indian car market is just really small, and it's not clear to me that it makes sense for them to build a factory there, although Chennai... I'm hearing a lot of good things from people, from Indian friends I know who think Chennai is a place for it. It would make sense. Maybe they could export. I don't know. I think the Indian government has a lot of, Indian governments have a lot of bureaucracy. When do you think they will find the driver that got away from the Texas driverless crash? I'm not sure what's going to happen. I think we will know more in a couple, well, probably a week away now. We'll probably know more in a week or so. Jarno asks, Warren, what is your work history and how did you get interested in Tesla? So, um... My work history is I graduated from, well, I did a, a variety of jobs before I graduated from law school, including uh, I taught English in Japan after graduating law school, taught English in Japan for a year. I came home, worked for a nurses union in New York, the New York State Nurses Association. Then I worked for the Allstate Insurance Company as a trial lawyer dealing with a lot of car accident cases. Then I worked for a judge dealing with a lot of car accident cases and other cases. Then I started my own law firm. And starting in 2003, still they arguably have a law firm, but you know, basically 2003 to the present, I had my own law firm. I handled personal injury cases. I handled a lot of criminal defense, a lot of drunk driving cases, a lot of traffic cases. I handled over 4,000 traffic tickets in New York State. Um, handled a bunch of drunk driving cases, a bunch of marijuana cases, a bunch of drug cases. Um, and uh, what was the question? How did I get interested in Tesla? So I've always been interested in cars particularly interested in crashes because of my experience. And I have the impression fairly early on that Teslas were very crash worthy. Um, I've been an Elon Musk fan, probably. I don't even know how long I've been an Elon Musk fan. Elon fan club t-shirt. Check out the description below for the shirts. There's all colors and there's, there's dark colors with white lettering. A lot of opportunities there. So I was a pay. I, I sold my legal services on PayPal, which is through PayPal. I made over a million dollars in revenue through PayPal, which I can thank Elon for. Um, but I think it was, you know, when the Roadster came out, I was aware of it. When the Model S came out, I was aware of it. I think I really started paying more attention when SpaceX landed the first orbital rocket booster. Um, I think that was big. And that's when I started buying Tesla stock was a couple months after that. So I, that's my best answer I can give you. I don't really remember exactly what happened there. Um, why is it taking so long to announce what happened in the Texas, Texas crash? How long does it normally take? In my experience, accident reconstruction can take two weeks or longer, can even take a month. You, you have to, they have to go out and they have to, um, there are, prof it's a, it's a, I'm going to call it a professional job, um, where they go out and they, they take a whole bunch of measurements. There's actually computer software that they use. They put in all the information and they're able to sort of predict you know where the thing was and figure out what happened they look at a lot of information it's a hard job 
Mark Patachik, why don't they mention why I was almost run over five times the last week by human drivers? I, I was driving yesterday. I picked my daughter up at the airport. We're coming out of Fort Lauderdale Airport. And I'm accelerating to get up to highway speed. And all of a sudden, this car comes from somewhere from the left and goes right across traffic in front of me. And there was nowhere to go. It was like going towards a wall. Like, I don't know what they were doing. I had to slam on the brakes. And I didn't have to swerve, I don't think. But I had to slam on the brakes and wait. It was like they were going to park on the side of the road in a place where you wouldn't park on the side. Like, what was going on with human pilot there? You know, it was crazy. Uh, I, I see human drivers doing stupid things all the time, and nobody says we should get rid of human drivers. Um, Nelson Silva says, I heard of six-month delay in Giga Berlin doing inspections. Do you know if it's true? That is not true. That is a bogus story that was told in a German news media, which was rebutted by a German economic minister the next day. Look, they had the Q1 call. They said they expect to start delivering cars in the, in, in the fourth quarter from both Berlin and Texas. Um, how can a normal little guy invest in SpaceX before the IPO? So little guy's tricky. If you are an accredited investor, which typically means you either have over $250,000 a year in annual income. I don't, I'm not sure exactly how they measure accredited investors. This is how I think you measure it. Or a million dollars in liquid assets. As in not including your house. then. If you go on uh, Equity Zen or Shares Post, there are some websites that will that you can get opportunities to buy in on SpaceX stock. I looked at it at an opportunity. It was like a six percent commission to buy into this fund. The fund had a two percent annual management fee. There was a twenty percent carried interest, which means they they take they take twenty percent of the profit off the top, and that might be twenty percent off what the profit from when it began, rather than from when you buy in. So I did not think that was a good deal. I would just rather, I think Tesla is going to grow as much as SpaceX. I would rather just buy Tesla stock because I don't have to pay all those expenses. John Check, thank you for your support. You know the crash was the guys screwing around. They pay for their lives, unfortunately. Yes. Um, it seems pretty likely that this was human pilot causing that crash, that somebody, somebody said, hold my beer, and that's what happened. I mean, I don't know for sure, but that's a good guess. There, there's evidence that the drive, there was a person in the driver's seat when the car crashed because the steering wheel was deformed. Um, Vorex says, do you plan to cover any Neuralink info with Max Hodak leaving? I did Neuralink. I did a, I think I did, I did a, last week's live stream I covered. So check the channel. Last week's live stream, I covered Neuralink's, uh, uh, Max Hodak's departure. And I did a short version in my channel, a shorter version about Max Hodak leaving this past week. Opzar says he saw a video of Model 3 going 260 kilometers per hour on the Nürburgring. Do we even know if that's limited artificially? I don't know that. I'm not, a, I don't really that much of an expert on the uh, performance aspects of Tesla cars. Like somebody said, I should, I should not say that the Model S flat is going to go zero to 60 in under two seconds. And there's some bogus story from Transport Evolved who has become an anti-Tesla channel. Think it's not really a sub two seconds zero to 60. Like, I'm just not interested in transport evolved anymore, so I don't care about that. Romu asks, Do I think James Dalma had a good time and will gladly come back for a second discussion? I think so. We talked about it. Um, I, I'm not in a hurry to do it. I'd like to do it again. You know, he did a lot of interviews with Dave Lee in a short time. I, I'm thinking maybe a month. Hopefully, we do it. Um, Rob says, Warren, why did Tesla have to issue an apology in China regarding the kook with the brakes? I am not convinced that Tesla issued an apology related to that. I believe the kook with the brakes did not lead to an apology. I think Tesla has a PR team in China, which is a different media market than the U.S., and they have a different government situation in the U.S. I don't really pay that much attention to what they're doing. I don't think it's terribly important. As far as I can tell, they're selling every car they can make in China. It's not a problem. Um, so Opsar said about the Texas crash, isn't it just a matter of measuring skid marks? I believe there's more to it than just measuring skid marks. I mean, there are crashes where there are no skid marks. So you look at, you can look at a lot of different things. There's a crash. You look at where the pieces of the car went and there's a whole bunch of things they do. And I'm, I'm not saying it's an exact science either. I I've seen where they're, they're not always perfect. <laughs> well, my kids inherit FSD, uh, I believe that if you own your car and you die and your kids get your car, they keep the FSD. Yes. 
Will Starlink be the largest ISP in the world in terms of number of customers? If not, where would it rank? Good question, Joe. I believe the answer is yes. I think that Starlink is likely to have more than 100 million customers, and I think that would probably make them the largest ISP. I don't know, because maybe China has one large ISP. I don't know how it works in China. China has a huge population, so I don't know whether there's multiple ISPs in China or if it's just one. What is it going to take to get the stock moving again? Q2 earnings. So I do not worry about short-term stock prices, and I would say if you are a long-term investor, you should not be worried about the short-term stock price. If the stock price is low and you have free cash, buy more. Why are you worrying about the short-term stock price? Can I explain the logic of a woman? Which, which depends on which woman. And the answer is no in any way. Uh, the logic of women. No, I cannot. I'm not sure I can explain the logic of men. Forget about women. Warren, do I know if there's a way to test blood alcohol content on a charred body? Yes, you can definitely test the blood alcohol content on, on, a, on a dead person who died in a fire. I'm confident that that could be something they could check if they wanted to. I I guess it depends if the blood, I suppose it's possible if the body was burned badly enough that they wouldn't be able to test it, but most likely they will be able to test it. Do I think FSD will be able to follow a cop's hand signals when he's directing traffic? Yes, absolutely. I think it will be able to do that. Do I think Elon will take a stance on UFOs once the disclosure is released in the US soon? Elon has taken a stance on UFOs. He says he does not believe that they're here. He says, if anybody would know, he would know. And he has not seen any evidence that there are UFOs here. Aliens are not here, unless it's him. Would Cybertruck in a crash remain largely intact? No, I think Cybertruck would deform. It would be designed to deform. It is safer if certain aspects of Cybertruck deform in a crash. It depends on the severity of the crash, of course. But generally speaking, cars deform in a crash. Johnny asks, what's my opinion on Dojo launch timeline? I want to say third quarter. I'm not sure. JF asked, do I like hockey? I used to watch hockey a lot. I don't watch hardly any sports anymore. I think hockey is a great sport. I played lacrosse, which is surprisingly similar to hockey. Um, so I kind of like hockey, but I just don't watch. No, he's not keeping hush because of clearances because of smoking pot. Elon has very clearly stated. People don't realize how hard it is to get from one star system to another. There's no aliens. Oh, Diedrich Goge says, how can Starlink sell 65 million just in the USA? Diedrich, do a Google search, Google News search for Starlink 65 million. You will find the article. Maybe it was North America, not just the US, but that's, that's only 20% of the US population. Don't I think Tesla must be doing great since he took a week off for SNL? Well, I don't think Elon ever really takes a week off. I think he may have taken a week off in a sense, but I think he's in communication with the team. And if they have questions, he deals with it. Um, but did, it did look sort of like a family vacation, though, I got to say. I thought Grimes looked particularly cute, by the way. She was surprisingly small. I didn't realize how small she was. Aliens could have the technology to access higher dimensions. They could literally appear and disappear right before our eyes. Or, they're, or we could be in a simulation, Rob. Do I think it would be possible to change the battery in my Tesla Model 3 to a newer model in the future? No. Well, is it possible? Yes. Is it going to be cost effective no i think the i don't know what year your model 3 is i think all model 3s the the vehicle is probably going to last with the battery 300 to 500,000 miles and by the time you use up your 300 to 500,000 miles you will have gotten tremendous value out of the car and the newer cars that exist on the roads at that time will be so amazing you won't want to keep your model 3 it's my opinion aren't the sharp corners on cybertruck dangerous to pedestrians I don't think so. As far as I know, they're not dangerous to pedestrians. And I think, you know, cars are dangerous to pedestrians, period. I don't know how sharp they really are. They, they may not be as sharp as they look. Um, but, you know, look, if you get hit by a vehicle at any speed, it doesn't matter whether it has sharp corners or not. Could I do a show on how to value an IPO like Starlink or Boring and whether one should invest pre or post IPO? It's a good question, Martin. I don't think I'm the right person for that video. I think that that might be, maybe that's a Gary Black conversation. I don't, I don't know who would even know the answer to that question. Um, I think what's ideal and what I would like to try to do is to form a fund that becomes part of a funding round. And then, I mean, you're paying a lot of expenses to be in such a fund, but if you get in early, like on Starlink or on, on um, a Neuralink or Boring Company, then I think it, it, it's worth it. 
Could Tesla could Tesla start could Tesla start giving more for an exchange of a Tesla when you buy a new Tesla because of the new recycling techniques coming? I don't think they're gonna recycle Teslas. I think they're gonna sell them or use them as robo taxis. Am I still getting three power walls? So Captain PD, the plan right now is we're just getting a regular roof. Um depending on what happens in Congress and, and Washington with the tax credit, if the tax credit for solar and batteries becomes really, really good. And once we have our new roof, which should be June, we're going to have a regular, not regular, it's a premium roof, but it's not a solar roof. Once we have our new roof up, then I will look at getting solar panels, but I will probably wait another year. I think our wall has gotten more expensive. I would get three power walls. Yes. Um, there's another theory that I might just do a small solar panel installation. Like I was targeting 12 kilowatts, but it might make sense to do a smaller solar install, like six kilowatts and two power walls that um, the benefit of that would be substantial. And the benefit of the third power wall and the extra six kilowatts might not be that great. Um, that, and if you can switch to my, my utility, I think you can switch to a system where you do what's called peak load shaving. You charge up the battery when the, when the energy is cheap, and then you discharge the battery when the energy is expensive. So you're reducing your consumption of electricity at the high rate time. And I think two power walls would be enough to cover my house for that peak shaving purpose. And then in, you know, major power outage, the power walls would hold enough for that too. Um, but I, you know, more likely if I'm going to go ahead and do it, I'm going to go ahead and do it. And I'm going to install 12 or even 18 kilowatts and three or four uh, power walls. But I, I think power wall is going to come down in price once battery production scales. So I guess is 20, 20, by the end of 2022, maybe in 2023, we're going to see power walls come down in price significantly. They're up. They, I think they actually raised the price of power wall. Um, Diedrich asks, don't know if you answered this, but why doesn't Tesla spend more money on building like five factories at the same time? They've got the money. You are correct that they have the money. And Diedrich, if you watched the Sandy Monroe interview with Elon, which I... I did a video about it. If you check my channel for the next generation Gigafactory. So here's the deal. I think that Tesla will, once they have made significant progress on Berlin and Austin, maybe they want to, maybe they'll wait till they finish. Maybe not. Once they um, make significant progress on that, I think we're going to see um, Tesla build the next generation Gigafactory. And once they figure out that they're going to build the next generation Gigafactory, I think they're going to build three at once. I don't think they need to build five because the three gigafactories are going to produce so many vehicles that they won't need a fourth and fifth gigafactory. Uh, Mitchell says Tesla solar was too pricey. I ended up just getting 365 watt standard panels. I am thinking about that, Mitchell, that I may just buy panels myself and put them on my roof myself um, rather than going with a contractor and, you know, maybe find a battery. I think there are some batteries out there and just do my own system, pay an electrician to hook it up. It probably would be cheaper than going with Tesla. You know, my impression is that Tesla is pitching themselves as the lowest cost provider of solar. I think if you hire someone else to install panels on your house, it gets expensive. But if you do it yourself, and I think I might be able to do it as my own contractor, it might make sense. Are there any green energy plays like STEM that you predict Tesla will partner with? Won't hold you to it. Just looking forward to your hunch. No, I don't. I don't. I think Tesla is partnering with utilities. I haven't seen them partnering with anybody else. Well, so Jason says Elon will figure out the roof. I think they think they're going to go to roofing robots. I think the solution to the roof is roofing robots, which I talked about with James Dauma. Um, maybe I'll make a video about that. So Brian says 100,000 cars a year, are produ 100 million cars a year are produced when Tesla produces 20 million a year and they can be used as robo taxi and then there's no room for others. So Brian, I think once the robo taxis start to dominate the roads, the cost of transportation goes down. And the number of trips goes up and the, the market for vehicles expands. The market, for, I mean, I think you're right that there's some kind of limit. I think the number of, and another thing is that the robo taxis might displace existing vehicles. It may become so cheap that it would make sense to get rid of a vehicle that's existing. That does, that, that still works. So um, I think there's sort of an upper limit of somewhere between 100 million and 200 million robo taxis on the roads before we've sort of hit the limit of what we can use now. But the use of transportation might increase dramatically if it gets really inexpensive and safe and convenient. 
Not financial advice. Thank you for your support. But does anyone know what Dogecoin is? I don't. How about a discussion with you, Rob, Dave Lee, Stephen, Mark Ryan, Advance of AI Day? Um, I've talked with Dave Lee before. I would love to go on his channel or Rob's channel. I don't think Stephen Mark Ryan does a lot of interviews. I would be happy to talk to any of them. I don't think I'm, I'm like I'm easily a notch below those three guys. You know, I've got like fifty thousand subs. Dave Lee has one hundred forty thousand. I think Stephen Mark Ryan has one hundred eighty thousand, and Rob has more than that. So I don't I don't think I'm on their level. I don't think they see me as being on their level, and I don't think I'm on their level either. Will Cybertruck get solar panel? I believe it's supposed to be an option on the back of the car, but it's not really particularly useful. Or mid-gate pass-through HVAC. I think Elon said he's going to try to do pass-through pass HVAC. Yes. What's Dogecoin? Roofing robots. Um, Opsar says roofing robots. They're denying installs on complex roofs, so I doubt it can be automated. So Opsar, what I'm saying is I think there are parts of the roofing job that can be done by robots. And the goal, and in the long run, anything could be done by a robot. But in, if you could replace half the labor with robots, number one, you're saving lives because roofing is a very dangerous job. And number two, the robots can work, you know, 24-7 if, if, they, if they're allowed to. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, do I think the gradual price increases to three and Y are in anticipation of impending credits or is it something else? Declan, great question. I think it's that and... I think it is in anticipation of impending credits. I think it's also demand is just through the roof and they literally can't make enough cars. So they might as well make more profit on the cars they're selling. I'm surprised they haven't raised prices more. Uh, I think also we're going to see that there's going to be a massive shift when, the, when Berlin and Austin start producing cars. The Wealth Journey says, do I think Tesla will do any share buybacks in the next five years at all? It's possible. I don't spend a lot of time worrying about things like share buybacks and splits. I don't think they're material. I think they're like accounting tricks and whatever. I don't think they're meaningful. What matters to me is how the company does. I don't really pay attention to the stock splits, share buybacks, whether they do dividends. I think they'll do dividends. I think they're going to produce so much cash, they're going to have to do dividends. Well, first delivery of Cybertruck happened in 2021 from Kartik. I don't think so. I think there's a small chance they deliver a couple cyber trucks in 2021, but it seems likely that they will deliver later. Romo says it's a bit weird. SMR, Stephen Mark Ryan hasn't collaborated with others on his channel. I think he said he has Asperger's. Um, I, I, you know, there's a, look, everybody does things a different way. Um, he's got his way of, I think he has worked out a system for how he does things and that's the way he does things. I know he has been interviewed. Um, do I think Tesla will build a UK Gigafactory? I think there's a chance that Tesla builds a UK Gigafactory. I think if, if Berlin is too difficult with building Giga Berlin, then I could see Tesla deciding the next factory might be in the UK. I'm not sure the UK would be their first choice, though. I think Eastern Europe makes more sense to me. Czechoslovakia or the former Czech Czechia, something like that. Slovakia. I think there might be opportunities there. I think the question would be. Where would you locate a gigafactory in Europe that's a place people would want to be? And right now, I don't think the UK is a fun place. I don't think there's many fun places in the UK. I have the impression that UK is kind of a miserable place right now because of everything that's happening with COVID and everything. But even without that, you know, where are you going to locate the factory? What is fun for people to do in that location? I think Eastern Europe has a lot going for it. Um, Berlin has a lot going for it. I'm not sure where else. Um, you know, what's the fun place to be? And Berlin definitely has that reputation. So Milan, maybe? I don't know. I'm not sure where else you would locate. But I think, you know, Italy has also got difficult regulatory environment. So I could see Poland, Hungary. Uh, somebody mentioned, I think it was Slovakia or Czechia. I think there's a lot of opportunities in places like that. Like Prague. Prague is a great city, isn't it? Wouldn't that be a great place to locate? Maybe. Um, comments on Kathy Wood's ETF fund seeing big outflows. I have not heard about that. I don't pay attention to it. Um, Ireland, you know, Ireland is attractive, I think, but I don't know if Ireland is big enough. I think there's a lot of advantages to Ireland. Like I personally would like to go to Ireland. I have friends who've been to Ireland and loved it. Um, so I, I think Ireland would make a lot of sense. And I think Ireland as in not part of the UK, Ireland 
would have access to the European market where the UK might not. Do I have a reason stance on why I think dividends are more likely than share buybacks? No, I don't. I don't have a reason stance. I don't understand why they do dividends. I don't understand why they do share buybacks. I think they're going to produce so much cash that um, the advantage of dividends is that Elon gets dividends and he can use the dividends from Tesla stock to pay for Mars. Like if you're Elon, you would want dividends so you can fund Mars. Uh, maybe there's another way he funds Mars. I don't know. I think holding cash at some point just becomes too big. Philippines is interesting. Um, I think Indonesia has really got potential for a gigafactory. I, I just don't see, and everybody thinks India is going to happen. I, my impression of India is the bureaucracy is just too thick. If Jim Whitehead says, Ireland is the home of some of the great, of the great tax dodges to say nothing of redheaded women. Um, definitely has a good reputation for taxes. Definitely has, a, I mean, don't forget the, don't forget the, the beverages. A lot of great beverages in Ireland. Um, I'm personally a fan of Mc, McEwen's I, Scotch Ale, which is not Irish. I'm not a fan of Guinness, but a lot of people love Guinness. But I, I think there's a lot going for the, for Ireland. Do I think Australia's new coal-fired car will be competition at Tesla? I haven't heard of it, and no. Uh, Stephen Mark Ryan thinks Elon takes MDMA and other hallucinogenics. Okay. All right, so we've gone uh, more than two hours. This is longer than I really wanted to go. Um, I have family uh, matters to attend to. My daughter's in town. It's Mother's Day. We're having people over in less than two hours. And I need to get ready. So before I go, I just want to quickly say um, to everyone, first of all, uh, please check and support the channel on Patreon. Um, Really appreciate any support we get on Patreon. Join the YouTube channel. Um, check out my book on Amazon, Fair DUI. Keep yourself safe in a traffic stop. Buy the merch. Elon stainless steel water bottle. The shirts. Elon fan club. And thank you so much for watching.